Hi everyone, welcome to another Fashion and the Tea webinar and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, before we start, you may have noticed that a lot of you are on mute and your videos are on mute. Um, it's just so that everyone can kind of hear us and that when the recording goes out, um, there's no distractions and it's purely kind of us on the on the recording and um, yeah, just stops any background noise kind of filtering in as well. Um, if you have any questions for us, as you'll see, there's a chat box. So just type the questions whenever throughout the webinar and we're going to have a little um, time set aside so that we can um, do that at the end. Um, if you haven't heard of us before, Fashion in the Free is a platform that I created last year to give the real people in the fashion industry a voice to share their stories, their knowledge and their expertise in the hope that it inspires and educates other professionals and students. You can check out the website fashionthefree.com and on Instagram at Fashion and the Free. Um, so for anyone that doesn't know, uh, my name is Emma and I'm the founder of Fashion and the Free. And I'm very excited to introduce today's guest, Sydney Badger from Public Habit. So, <laughs> so for those of you that are familiar with Fashion and the Free, you may have read an article that we did with Sydney last year. So some of you may be familiar with her story. Um, if you haven't, I'm going to add a link at the end so you can check out the article afterwards. Um, so Sydney is the co-founder and CEO of Public Habit, a slow fashion brand transforming the fashion supply chain with their made to order timeless wardrobe staples. Prior to launching Public Habit, Sydney worked for the likes of corporate giant Amazon and the legendary Ralph Lauren. It was her experiences in the world of corporate fast fashion that drove her and her co-founder to disrupt the traditional fashion business model. Sydney is still currently based in Seattle, and I'm so excited she's taken the time out of her busy schedule to share her knowledge, advice, and top tips for today's discussion, Fashion Disruptors, a new business model for sustainable slow fashion. So hi, Sydney. Welcome. Hi. Thank you for being here today. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. How is your day going so far? It's going well. I um, have a seven month old at home, which was kind Aww. of how I spent 2020. So I got to... I can't believe it's seven months now. That's I crazy. Know. I know, I know. And uh, yeah, he's finally, you know, sleeping and being really fun now. So Aww. we just ate some avocado this morning is what we did. <laughs> and, uh, and here we are. That was so good. So yeah. I'm going to probably get onto at some point, um, you know, how you're balancing that co-founder CEO life with having a baby as well. So we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, I began obviously telling your story like a little bit, um, but I would love for you to pick up where I left off and just tell everyone a bit about your background in fashion um, and why you, know, you felt like it was the right thing to do to kind of leave that corporate world of fashion to eventually launch Public Habit. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks again so much for having me here. Um, and just, I'd love to get a sense um, without having to kind of ask everyone is the, but in general is the, the participation is usually from more of the entrepreneurial side or the fashion brand side or students, like, is there a general sense of where everyone's coming from? I don't know if anyone could put a few things. Yeah, in. I'll, just in the chat. Ooh, I'll, I'll jump right in though to, um, you know, circa 2018, I was at Amazon here in Seattle, which is where I'm based now. I um, definitely would consider myself an outsider to the fashion industry for any of those here working for brands like Levi's um, <laughs> or in coming from urban like yourself. Um, it's a very, very insular closed world and it has been for quite some time. Um, I kind of stumbled into Ralph Lauren as one of my first jobs out of university in New York and I fell in love with this buyer role. I had no idea what it was um, but like many people who kind of have both an analytical and a creative brain like I do, I really loved that mix of, of the art and science and all of a sudden I was kind of working my way up in the merchandising and buying world and found it to be a really fun um, mix of skill sets and loved being kind of close to product but also close to analytics and then I went over to Amazon in 2013 so kind of dating myself so I spent almost six years at Amazon 
um, in lots of different roles um, from the buying team for Amazon Fashion to the digital marketing and PR team for Amazon Fashion as they were when they were working with CFDA and and sponsoring some like men the first men's fashion week in New York um, and as Amazon was trying to figure out its legs in what do we want to be in the fashion world um, and then I also did things um, for within Amazon's brick and mortar businesses like Amazon Go and the Amazon Bookstore. So really, it was an incredible experience. I, I always say it was like my MBA in a company yeah. where I didn't have to go and pay a lot of money to do it. I was actually getting paid to learn all these different different businesses and get a lot of ownership in a lot of areas. Um, but by 2018, I was not only burnt out, it was I was really disconnected from the work. I um, I felt like I had no real purpose and what I was doing and I felt very drained I didn't have any energy from the day-to-day -day. and I know that that rings true for a lot of people who are looking to make a change whether it's within the same company or going somewhere else and I started really getting a bit nervous about seeing the rest of my life kind of fl like flash before my eyes and I was you know, I was not yet married, I didn't have kids, but I all of a sudden saw how easy it could be to kind of just get stuck in yeah, a place, yeah. especially as life starts happening to you. And um, I felt like it was my time to to jump. And if I wasn't going to jump then and try something riskier, then I may never do it. So that took me to um, leaving Amazon in 2018 and teaming up with a former co-worker of mine to basically start off as a fashion line in basics was the very first iteration of public habit. So yeah. um, I had had a lot of experience in Asia. I actually studied Chinese in university. And so I had lived in Shanghai. I had a lot of respect for, um, for China and the expertise that they had in the fashion space. It's a very, um, this is probably a pretty controversial topic, but um, I could talk about China production for days. So I really wanted to get on the ground there and understand better about sourcing, product development, and really do it on my own. Um, and that was really where the journey to public habits started in earnest, because what I learned in that sourcing and product development journey just blew my mind, despite how close I'd been to the fashion industry when you're really touching and seeing in product and you're seeing that supply chain in motion, it really, you can't look back. And the sustainability issues became like, you know, front and center. Yeah, I can imagine. I feel like it's not until you, I think you, when you're working at some of these brands, you know, you touch upon a lot of different areas, but you don't necessarily get to do a deep dive on them. And I think when you're then tasked with doing that or when that's, you know, what your your goal is, then I think it's definitely probably pretty eye-opening. Um, yeah, I mean, even at Amazon, to even think about you, I almost felt like I could have been selling any product. It could have been jump ropes. Like that's how removed from the product and, um, and the makers and the development you are when you're at a giant like that and you know Ralph Lauren was different because it was such a product centric company and design centric company but um, you're still really removed from um, some of those issues like deeply rooted in the supply chain and and that's that's really what lit me up once we started the journey yeah sourcing our own product yeah, totally. I, mean, I I don't want to talk about myself too much in this, but uh, last, was it a couple of years ago now with a company I used to work with, they allowed us to do, as part on our China trip, I was like, I really want to go and see the print and dyeing houses. And when I went, it was the first time I'd seen them in person and I was absolutely horrified. <laughs> it just was the working conditions, the smell, the, no one was wearing a mask in there um and you know these yeah. are pretty toxic fumes in there and no one was wearing any kind of protective wear yeah um the amount of water that just there was just so much and yeah. i think you know you can talk about it to the cows come home but like until you've actually like seen it in person it does a whole different thing to your yeah. perspective on it um absolutely 
and so yeah that's kind of I think for anyone that's kind of like you know on this uh, chat right now you know you really do if you're able to go and see everything in person because it's it's a different world to what you think it might be you know yeah and I think that connection is so lost for the end customer to think about um where this where this all started and you know how many hands touch a product before it gets to a beautiful rack in a store and I think um uh for us the big eye-opener was the waste that we encountered on our journey it was walking into factories and seeing endless rolls of fabric from brands having cancelled orders, uh, surplus from an order, um, very, very, very minor defects on something that a brand just said, no, won't do it, this doesn't pass QC, to the, um, to the tune of just that, that fabric wasn't going to go anywhere except landfill. And, and then we started really digging into this waste issue, and that was just on kind of almost the product development design end it wasn't even to say that one in three garments made is never even sold so this whole concept of brands designing and making products six to 12 months in advance and making too much of the wrong stuff yeah. is just so endemic in the industry and that that just has been frustrating me for a year and a half now and um oh yeah I think it is the single biggest challenge to the industry over production. And that's, that's really what we're trying to tackle at Public Habit now. Yeah, I can completely um, agree with all of that. Cause I know that, you know, sometimes you would like you were saying, you know, you make a collection or design a collection a year in advance. And then maybe like several months before they're like, oh my gosh, this trend's changed. Um, it's not about this anymore. We need to do this. Sometimes a whole entire collection would be scrapped to yep. to start I mean you know this but like to start a new one because maybe the trend we'd missed the trend or there was a new bigger trend that they thought they were going to make more money off of the whole thing is just like exactly. <laughs> yeah as well I like to think about it in terms of almost like a push pull like the way the model works today for any of us who have worked in a larger fashion company where you would review a line you know 12 to 18 months in advance go and make it in bulk so that you could maintain cheap product cost and so that you could maintain a margin further down the line all of a sudden you you design more than you need then you make way more than you need and then you sell a fraction of that and you end up with at least 50 billion garments a year that go with that literally are going mostly to landfill with their tag still on it because they were made and they've got no customers. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's an enormous challenge, um, but it's there's 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 ha stuff happening and it's really yeah. exciting what's happening. So, um, oh, yeah. I think I just I think the realization that I was part of the problem for so long, both as a consumer and as someone working in the industry with a line item for liquidation for this is what I'm going to mark down um it's kind of hard to reconcile sometimes but um yeah it's yeah. also quite motivating oh yeah 100 so for anyone that I mean there's probably a lot of people by the looks of it in the group that already know what this means but if you can explain to everyone you know from your fashion model you kind of with public habit is really described as slow fashion so maybe you can explain to everyone what that means in comparison with fast fashion? Yeah, um, so I think obviously I'm not talking to people who are brand new to this, but the way that I that I think about slow fashion is really about intentionality and and almost anti-trend. I think the biggest, as we've having been kind of a product of the 90s and having grown up with high street fashion in the UK, which was all around fast trends. Um, the fast fashion industry really has developed a model of very cheap, low quality clothing that turns really, really quickly. So think about 52 drops a year, a new drop of clothing every single week to try and keep up with street city trends like celebrity trends runway trends like you name it just trying to offer new 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 and the only way to do that 
and have scales to do it as cheaply as possible, which has created some really atrocious um, working conditions, uh, wages. I mean, you you name it. There's there's plenty of of things to unpack in terms of just like the social impact of, of fast fashion. But then um, I obviously am obsessed with the waste that that also generates because they're constantly producing in bulk and bulk and bulk, and like no one has enough time to even really evaluate like did we make the the right stuff and um and how much of that ended up never being sold because we were on to the next thing slow fashion on the other hand um is really just a return to basics and a return to um to craftsmanship it typically is uh, associated with a more of a made to order or bespoke model so the product will typically take longer to get to you in our model it's actually kind of ironic because we we only make what we sell so we own no inventory it's entirely on demand so when we receive a customer order we route those to our factories overseas we produce within seven to ten days and then the customer will receive their their order within 21 to 25 days is basically our average lead time so that three to four week lead time is epically slow in in the scheme of 2021 but it's incredibly fast if you really understand mm-hmm. the fashion supply chain how it's typically been on this kind of six to 18 month lead time mm-hmm. um, but what customers obviously don't see is all of this planning all of this bulk production and all of this ocean freight arriving to a warehouse somewhere so while we are slow fashion and um, we're actually very quick um so it's kind of a and i I almost think we're more sustainable fast fashion in some respects because um, we're fast in terms of supply chain, but really, really intentional about what we make. Um, and I do think that, um, you know, newness is part of fashion. Like there is, there is, that is not going anywhere. But I do think um, one of the things coming out of the pandemic has been more of a return to um, you know, fewer SKUs, um, you know, more longevity, how do we get more out of what we already have? And I, and all of that kind of fits within the slow fashion ethos, I think. Yeah, I think it's been really encouraging, actually, like you were saying earlier, to see how many brands are like pivoting <clears throat> towards a new way of working, um, even from from brands that maybe like the newest trend was the biggest thing like some of them you can see are kind of stepping away from that and I think I'm seeing more and more like positivity there's obviously still like so much that needs to be done with especially a lot of the bigger brands that you know I won't go into it too much but you know they'll have a ton of product selling by the masses but they'll have like a small section that's like hey this is organic or this is sustainable and you know there's definitely a lot of that still going on um but i am encouraged by the amount of other brands that are going the right way about it for sure yeah i mean there's some amazing stats i read that um there's more more brands were uh, incorporated in like january 2021 than ever before in history we've got this huge spike in entrepreneurship happening right now which is amazing and I do think that the change comes from like the little engine that could like all of us small guys banding together to do things differently um but knowing what I know if 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 all of those brands are also trying to compete with trend and compete with the latest you know the lounge set that was like everything for 2020 and then the tie-dye trend all of a sudden that my mind starts going to well, now you've got thousands more brands that are producing more than they need because the model still hasn't changed on the supply chain end. Yeah. So uh, I'm really passionate about taking public habit forward now is actually how do we help brands and designers and creators bring product to market in a, in a more sustainable, less impactful way. So we're going to continue with public habit as our brand, but then we're also working on powered by public habit, which will be our kind of supply chain platform to it to really help brands bring their product to market with zero inventory, minimal waste, and, and try and fix that side of it so that the small guys can, can do it in the right way and start impacting how the big guys are doing it too. 
Yeah, so I mean, I'm going to skip over a couple of the questions I'm going to ask you and I'm going to come back to those because I want to pick up on like what you're talking about now and just, you know, when you guys first started, you know, and you had this vision, you had this idea of what you wanted to do, how did you, because I think this is the hardest bit for a lot of people, is how did you even go about finding the right manufacturers for you? That, a lot of the problems you'll run into is, you know, you might talk to a lot of manufacturers and they're not prepared to maybe do that kind of yep. model that you guys yep. have implemented. And, you know, a lot of it is, you know, they have MOQs and there's, there's all sorts of, um, issues can run into so I feel like you might have found like a unicorn factory here or because <laughs> I've never heard of you know anyone that's said yes to something like that before well you have to um we've talked to over 220 suppliers to find three that we're working with so it's um it's taken quite a lot of groundwork to to find who we're willing to work with but this is back to my point around why I've got so much respect for made in China because obviously with you know China has been the world's factory for quite some time but they've also advanced their technology and and grown up in the 50 years that they've been doing this but more so than the U.S. has and so they're really focused on how do we how do we do this more efficiently with less impact? So whether it's, you know, the factories that we found that are recycling water within their facilities, or more importantly, the factories that we found that said, we need to be able to optimize for really low MOQ, quick turn product, because that's the world that we live in. We don't live in a world with, you know, and where we need 10,000 socks in one print, we actually need to be able to print you know, 50 different prints across those units. And so for us, going into these conversations and being really clear about what we were looking for, which was, can you do an MOQ of one unit? Like, what does that look like? Can you make that profitable for you, factory? Can Does that work? Um, meant that we got hundreds of no's to get three yeses. Um, but we knew it was out there and more and more so we're finding, you know, that on demand is becoming more of a priority for for manufacturers to figure out how to be competitive because um, basically this um, the way that this industry has changed. Like as you'll see, like globally, all of the sourcing kind of moved to moved to China, moved to Asia in say the 50s and 60s, and then China got started becoming was you know the cheapest labor that that we could find. All of a sudden that started shifting, China became more expensive. And so fashion industry just kept moving to the next cheapest place, the next cheapest place. It was Vietnam, it was Bangladesh. Yeah. And that's been where it's continued to evolve over the last 30 years. And we firmly believe that the lowest cost sourcing is bad for everyone. It effectively means you can't, I mean, you're if you can buy a t-shirt for less than a than you pay for a can of soup then something's really wrong with uh, with that supply chain so for us we're, mu we're we're willing to spend almost up to 50 percent of our margin for labor and materials because they need to be just they are just as important as the rest of our supply chain and um if not the most important part of it so for us it was really willing to pay being willing to pay a premium for um for quality and for low moq um and continuing to just find the right partners you know it's a relationship business like we also just needed people who are willing to take a risk with on us and um vice versa so i think yeah being persistent was also key how long do you think that took you guys? Was it quite a long, like over a series of months? Yeah, I mean, again, the benefit of me speaking Chinese and being on the ground in Asia in, you know, I moved to Shenzhen, China before the pandemic. Right. And that sped things up vastly. I was on the ground. I was visiting factories almost every day. But I think it took us. I think it took us a few months to find who we wanted to work with. Um, we were very, initially, we were probably doing what a lot of people here are doing, whether it's searching from Alibaba, yeah. um, you know, just Google searching for... Yeah, there's, I think there's a 
Court as well, it's called, is quite a good one. Yeah. Common Objective is a nice new new platform that's yeah, trying that to really highlight um, more sustainable and more kind of specific yeah. suppliers. That, and I, I like what they're doing, but it's, um, you know, still a lot of the people that are doing really great work don't have English as a first language. And, you know, you really have to get involved in what's happening on the ground in China. So that was a real advantage that, that we had. Yeah, I think it's been really hard for people in the last year to talk about entrepreneurship. Um, and I think that's what's been so hard for people in the last year is that they haven't been able to personally go to the, visit these factories. I mean, I've even found that hard myself, like working with different clients and we're trying to source factories, but we can't go and be there in person. It's really, really hard to... It's still, I think, one of the hardest parts of the process, which is, again, why I think our vision for Powered by Public Habit is to have a digital platform so that people could actually source and you know, basically link their point of sale customer website yeah. with our supply chain platform and have visibility to all of our suppliers, be able to communicate directly with, with our suppliers that are already pre-vetted by us. And again, you know, we have to do the work of, ex of being able to walk people through how we vet and how we've onboarded these suppliers. But yeah. there's a lot of a lot of work and a lot of opportunity in in kind of enabling more transparency between the suppliers and the ultimate buyers and there's there's still a lot of work to do there but that's um i think one of our biggest opportunities for public habit is being able to really um take what we've learned and make it more accessible to entrepreneurs so you said that's still in the works or when you, do you have an idea yeah, what it's you're basically, it? we have a couple of clients on boarded the powered by Hub public habit now so we're basically taking their line of knits through our supply chain before we actually kind of um, publish what what would be powered by public habit enabling people to kind of log on and and um and fulfill the orders through through our site but Obviously, that's something I'd be more than happy to talk about with anyone who's interested on the yeah. um, on the chat. Because um, I do know that there's just a lot of hesitancy about how do I how do I trust them? How do I know what I'm going to get? How do I put myself out there in a way that's going to have some ROI? Because it could just feel like a black hole. Um, yeah. And then you know, trying to find an MOQ that's reasonable is still really hard. To your point, so. We're trying to do some of that like work for people. Yeah, I think that's really amazing that you guys have gone from kind of brand to pivoting, you know, in that, I mean, obviously you're still going to keep public habit, like your actual brand going, but I think that's really cool that you, you're pivoting to that to like help other people. Well, it's well. about impact from my standpoint. I mean, I know we may get a touch on this depending on how much time we have, but building a DTC brand is hard. It is so hard and the impact that we can have as one small voice without VC funding, which is something that we're being pretty deliberate about not going after, um, is going to be a really slow journey unless you have extreme amounts of luck and or, and or just the right network to make it happen. And I know that doesn't paint a particularly rosy picture of of what it takes, but it's a really crowded space and it's really easy and relatively affordable to launch a brand, but then to actually build and grow an audience that's sustainable is very expensive and very hard. Um, and so from where we still, we could, we can have, we can change a lot more by helping brands um, produce on demand than we can by just working exclusively on public habit and getting that message out to the masses yeah no I think that's great I mean I guess one of the things I wanted to ask you as well and you've touched upon it a little bit is of everything you've kind of done like what kind of difficulties and bumps in the road did you guys face along the way that probably like I mean I'm sure there's a there's a lot but like what ones kind of stand out to you oh wow <laughs> <laughs> you know I'll kind of, I mean, there's, I could do a whole thing about COVID specifically, but um, I think that messaging has been quite hard um, because 
obviously the solution that we're providing is is a supply chain solution it's around minimizing waste and and producing only what we need it's not a very sexy message it's not tied to things that um consumers really know much about or necessarily want to know a lot about you know the whole like you know, our first tagline that we wanted to put out there was um factory to consumer direct from the source or something along those lines like we had the word factory in there and we got all this feedback from advisors that you had to take the word factory out of all of our messaging no one wanted to think about the factory oh. and that really stuck with me it's just like if we're not willing to know where this stuff is, that this stuff is made in factories, that everything that we're wearing for the most part is made in a factory, and that more often than not, it's made in a pretty scary looking factory like what you saw, then this is never going to change. Um, and so I still think that messaging is really hard. It's really hard to break through um, when there's a lot of noise around sustainability, there's a lot of greenwashing, it's really hard for consumers to understand what the hell any of it means. Um, and and when you're you're standing, you you feel like you're like yelling to no one, just being like, but we're already just making more than we need. We just need to stop making so much, you know. I just I found that um that getting through to consumers with a with a really clear simple message has been really challenging um and i think the other thing is i think price and quality is still really challenging because we wanted we want to make public habit available to the masses so that on demand doesn't continue to be kind of some bespoke premium luxury but the reality is that we can't make a cashmere sweater well in a way that we are very proud of for $75. That's just not possible um, based on the quality of the yarn that we're working with, the suppliers that we're working with, our ability to do on demand. So that continues to be really challenging because um, we can only serve so many customers who probably already have kind of a a different access to to information than others do so and when you talk about impact like that's challenging too it's not true because i think you know when you are charging um certain prices you know higher prices for these garments the the unfortunate part of that is then it alienates a huge group of people that really want to be able to afford it and just can't and so that's always like the challenge with responsible and sustainable fashion in yeah. general is that yeah. you know there is that that tough divide because you you know you can't be against people or anything that you know aligning around the block for primark because that might just be all they can afford and right. so that's the toughest to me that's the toughest challenge about responsible and, and slow fashion yeah. as well is just making it affordable for everyone too but then that's so hard because everyone kind of you know needs to be paid a fair wage and it's expensive to produce well i i we what we try and talk about a decent amount is price per wear which is getting a little bit yeah. of attention in terms of how do we think like the biggest impact that we can all have in our own wardrobes is just by keeping things and wearing things longer, like hand full stop. Um, but with the rate of fast fashion and how little we're wearing the clothing that we have, um, that is kind of throwing that all out the window. So when I do think about one of our cashmere sweaters that you could wear a hundred times, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden that brings that down to, you know, $5 per wear versus, a $15 dress from Primark. Like I do think that there's there's an argument for for sh shifting behavior, but shifting behavior takes a really, really long time. Um, and it's really hard for any of us in a kind of emotional impulsive category like fashion to think like, well, this sweater, if I wear it a hundred times, then I will be only paying X, Y, Z for it versus like, oh, I just really love that thing. And and that's why I think there's going to need to be more regulation on the brand side to really 
change this because um, consumers can't be asked to have those rational thoughts in every moment in time when they're presented with <laughs> a lot of product and just yeah. vast range of price points. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I think the thing is, people just got to have a look in their wardrobes only to see that, you know, some of their favorite pieces they've had for, you know, maybe like yeah. five to 10 years. Well, if you yeah. were to divide how many times you've worn that, it probably cost you pennies, you know. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so that's definitely yeah. something to consider. I mean, I think some of my favorite pieces were things I spent a bit extra on, but that were well made, a um, little bit higher end price point, but they've lost, you know, it might have lasted me for like over 10 years now. So it's yeah. been completely worth it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I want to talk about um, transparency as well. Um, what steps have, have you taken at Public Habit to be fully transparent with your customer base? Because I think that's such an important topic right now for a lot of brands. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this was always important for us to actually make the factory workers, factory owners, part of the story of each of our products. So if you do go to our website, we have um, quite a lot of information that we share, uh, both interviews that we've had with factory owners, um, video footage that we actually put on our social media, just talking to um, our suppliers, talking about why they got into the business, just kind of humanizing that these are people just like us with families and and jobs that they go to every day. But from a um, kind of from an ESG standpoint and how we think about evaluating um, their footprint, we actually developed what we call kind of a nutritional label for sustainability with um, um, a company called, um, gonna blank on the name. Um, but effectively, if you go to, our factory page which I can share after um, there's each of our factories graded according to um, its output on water electricity and carbon and we basically review all of our factories uh, utility bills like we get monthly utility bills which is from our standpoint the best access that we have to um, what they actually produce as a way to um, back into what the energy usage is at the at the unit level so how much water it takes to make one sweater how much how much uh, electricity it takes to make one sweater and we do that by at the factory level and then we also use a qualitative metric to grade our factories um, which is basically our, our way of saying where there's room for improvement because every factory is going to have room for improvement so whether it's um, you know, that we haven't seen um, certifications for raw materials. We'll say that that's room for improvement and we grade the factories A to, a to F and currently we only work with A and B factories. Um, but we're trying to kind of present the information in a way that's as objective as possible, meaning like we literally pull data from a factory and spit it into a label that we can't modify. But the problem is you'd have to trust that we are doing that. You know, this, there's still no FDA for fashion. There's no, you know, governing body that is gonna say, um, that, that is going to tell us like, what is a good, like a reasonable amount of water for one garment to use. So we're just, we're putting the data out there. We're trying to talk to our factories and make them part of our story to the end customer but um it does it, it is still all self self-reported and i think that that is um we just have to own that like you, like that that is what it is and it's gonna and these supply chains are really hairy from all these companies and as long as um, i think the relationship is still the most important part of it that we know who we're working with and they aren't subcontracting the work to someone else yeah no I think it's, it's so important I think and I think that's what really impressed me like when I first you know started chatting to you and I like, looked at your website I was just so impressed I don't think I'd ever seen a brand that was quite as transparent and like really owned the the whole process like that it was so visible to the customer and I was just like wow this is incredible because you know there's a lot of people that are great at like showing hey this is who made your clothes and I think that's also a really good thing when they take pictures of people 
that maybe make up the tea that you know their team in India for example you know who are making their clothes I think that's great but to actually see it all labeled out almost like in a diagram that you guys had done you know so, so it was really clear to the customer like exactly like how the process like works yeah I, I mean me. I just I think maybe it comes back to this outsider mindset like I never felt like I felt like a beginner at this. I still feel like a beginner at this. And I think maybe that's something that all of us entrepreneurs kind of have in common is that you're just, you're trying to figure it, it all out, whatever the next challenge is as you go. And I think for me, I just, I felt like I needed to share everything I was learning as I was going because I probably didn't know it all. And I was probably gonna need to change my assumptions as I went and I'll the best way we could do that is kind of bring the customers along with everything we were learning yeah no I agree I think it was such a yeah as I said I was really impressed by it when I first saw it I thought that was such a cool way of of showing them um so just got a couple more questions before we go to the chat box so if anyone has um any more questions I've seen a few that popped up so if anyone has any more questions for Sydney um just feel free to type them in the chat because we'll be getting to those shortly um so one thing that's been really cool that I've seen with you guys so far is that all of a sudden I've started seeing um you know the likes of Hayley Bieber and uh who else is it Gigi and yeah, Miranda Kerr Miranda Kerr wearing your stuff which is incredible it's like one of those things that you know a lot of brands you know it's not necessarily something they strive for but it's something that if it happens it's great because you know if your brand's out there then like even more so than it was before so yeah. I wanted to know like you know obviously how you even build that audience to start with and you know I know you've worked with influencers and it's just be interesting to know kind of how you guys went about that side of things yeah um yeah it's it's been kind of a crazy month it's it's really exciting I remember I always would see certain brands and that someone important wore on one day and then you know you assume that there's some hockey stick moment for that business and you know, there was everything before and then there was everything after that person wore it. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's not exactly how it works. You can have a very <laughs> spiky moment and a very exciting moment when something like that happens, but the fundamentals don't change. Um, I think the, the way this came about was we had to pivot during COVID because our biggest um, sales driver before the pandemic was a lot of physical pop-ups that we were doing. Um, people really wanted to see and touch and try on this product, given that it was a longer lead time. And so we'd been partnering with quite a few local boutiques, clean beauty brands, things like that, to get the product in, in front of people. Obviously, we had to put all of that on, on hold. And then we felt like the next best way to kind of build our community was going to be through the voices and the platforms of kind of sustainability experts and influencers in that space. Um, and it was a good opportunity for us to kind of test this powered by public habit concept. How do we be more behind the scenes and enable designers and creators to bring their own product concepts to market? Um, and so we basically built a partnership model with two influencers that we worked with towards the end of last year, who have really amazing voices in the world of sustainable fashion. Cassandra, you can find her at Cassandra at Instagram, and then Sophia Lee, who is at Sophie, S-O-P-H-F-E-I on Instagram. And Sophia's got a background in um, uh, in journalism, in, in, in environmental activism. She was also creative director at Vogue, which was kind of unbeknownst to me. So what I would say, there's a lot of luck in this game. I stumbled on a partnership with someone who I felt had a really unique voice in the space of um, how she was talking about the intersection between racism and the Chinese American experience. She's a Chinese American living in New York and environmentalism. And I just loved her content. And I just thought that she'd be a really great person to, um, kind of be able to use her platform to share the message about how 
much needs to change in the fashion industry. And it turns out that she was really, really keen to better understand the fashion supply chain. How do you develop product? And it just so happens that she had some very, very, very famous friends. And um, and it really, you know, with her Vogue contacts and um, and things like that, one thing led to another. And we gifted a few pieces and um, little did we know that the day that Gigi received a public habit set, she wore it out. And um, so I woke up on a Monday or a Tuesday morning to one of my friends in England forwarding me a picture from the Daily Mail, which of course, if you live in the UK is like, yeah, your porn, it's just ridiculous. They just love it there. And as, as she said, is that public habit? And of course they hadn't credited us because we had no idea that this was coming. And so there's just Gigi out for a walk with her baby um, wearing public habit. And then that led to quite a few um, other, you know, between Marie Claire, Harper's Bazaar, and then Vogue picking it up. And then Vogue wanted to run some coverage on the brand that Gigi was wearing. So um, that's really the behind the scenes. I don't know if that makes people more or less impressed. <laughs> it's very <laughs> it's And I think as well, like, it sounds like you guys weren't going out of your way to to see yeah. how this kind of happened for you. Well, exactly. And I, you know, we could have spent we could have spent all of our time trying to make that happen. And I think it would be just as likely to to just happen randomly. Um, you know, I just think that there is a lot of luck in the game um, unless you have that network at your fingertips. And, you know, the only thing I would say is like, I really stuck to my guns on, on these influencers that we partnered with. They weren't the ones that were obviously going to convert a lot of customers. They were much more focused on talking about the issues, talking about politics talking about the news talking about things that are important and um that was controversial people were like well they don't sell fashion on their on their social media pages so why would you partner with them wow. and I, I really believed that um it's going to be people who we call our change maker program people making those changes that um, are going to really help us move the move the fashion industry forward yeah, I completely agree. I think it's been it's been really amazing as well for to see the growth from I think when I first stumbled upon your page to you know where you guys are at now, you know, it's been really cool to see that already. And I'm so excited to see kind of how that continues in the next few years for you guys too. Um I wanted to just finish before we go to questions with if you have any helpful advice for anyone starting their own brand or any top tips for juggling motherhood with with running a brand. Um, I think the most important things that have helped us along the various pivots that we've been on with the with the brand have been to never say no to a conversation with someone. Um, you just never know where it will lead and what's half an hour of your time. Um, it could it could potentially be illuminating in some direction or lead to some helpful um, helpful new connection. So I definitely would say that it takes a village, and so definitely don't undervalue how everyone even those that you don't think at face value could be useful could help you. Um, and that also goes to being able to ask for help, which is people are really willing to help, really, really willing to help. Um, and the other thing that I found, you know, I'm a pretty high achieving type A person and I am always my own worst enemy in this. I'm always the one holding myself back a lot on on this journey just you know self-doubt about well why could I how am I going to be the one to be able to make this happen like even the day that the Vogue article came out I was like well if they really knew who it was I'm like just be proud of that like this amazing moment um and so it I would say that it um the only piece of advice I have is like no one's more capable than you are of doing this like no one knows what you know um 
you will have a different approach than every other human on the planet of what you're what you're trying to do. So just those small steps really, really add up. And so for me, the ability to keep going despite a lot of self-doubt along the way is really just in hindsight, it's just a lot of really small steps, really, really small steps. And just knowing that reminding yourself there's no one better capable of doing it than you. Yeah. And what about juggling having a little baby? Oh, still figuring that out. Um, <laughs> you know, it is another child um, having a business and having a baby. Um, I we launched a big collaboration the day after I had my son Elliot and luckily my co-founder took on a lot of the um the extra work in those those early weeks but you know you just never know how you're going to respond to to motherhood for the first time this is my first child and I I was surprised at how quickly I wanted to get back into it and have something else to think about. So um, I think it was a really nice distraction. But the only other thing I'd say is the wonderful thing about being an entrepreneur is that I get to kind of drive the speed at which anything happens. And for me to kind of make peace with the fact that things may take an extra three to six months so I could put that thing on hold to give myself a bit of space was really liberating. You know, there was no external pressure other than my own. Um, and so if you've got the freedom to do that, then then take it is, is what I'm what I'm learning. Yeah, 100%. Um, so we have a couple of questions I'm going to ask before we wrap this up. Um, one of them is from David. He said, how has your is it, no, it says, has your business model been affected by the new tariffs and trade wars with China, particularly in the USA? That's actually a really good question. Mm. Um, yes and no. Um, so trade wars and tariffs were already up by the time we were sourcing. So, you know, this was 2018 uh, when we were really starting to kick off some of our early trips to China and that and the tariffs were already in place. Um, because of our model, we actually fulfill directly from the factory to the end customer. So everything is shipped in ones as opposed to bulk exported. And depending on how much you know about um, freight forwarding and exporting logistics, um, there's actually an agreement between China Post and US PS so that anything under the $800 mark doesn't have to pay tariffs. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to pay tariffs on our product, which was another reason that we really believed in this model of directly from factory to customer, because the bulk production will actually really hit you in terms of those tariffs and the speed at which you can get the product from Asia to the US. Um, that being said, it comes with kind of kind of the geopolitics. I mean, it's, it's a complicated issue and we've had several customers who are really unhappy about the fact that we produce in China. Um, you know, purely from a business standpoint, it, it has been fine, if not better than fine, because, you know, the pandemic, for example, they were, they were down for a bit, but then they were back up and running much quicker than anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. um, but the political relationship is, is, certainly complicated and from a carbon footprint standpoint if we really were to be as good as we can be nearshoring does make more sense than flying product from asia to the us um but the technology of the factories here are not where they are in china so we we aren't there yet got it I that answered the question yeah no i think you did <laughs> I think it's quite difficult with China, like you said, with the politics and everything right now, obviously there's been a lot of things that have come out of China recently that has been really controversial, but I think at the end of the day, you're working with a factory and a supply chain that are doing things the right way. Well, that's the thing. It's like, you can't, you can't call an entire country bad because of how the government runs certain things. And I think it's like a very, tricky thing to say China is bad versus China has some really, really 
awful policies and certain things that they're doing in certain regions are really, really terrible. So, uh, you know, there's a blog post on our page around why made in China, if anyone wants to go and really geek out about it. But um, something I'm very passionate about trying to dispel some of these myths around made in China. Um, they're not going anywhere. I mean, just, just to think about how important to everything in our lives, from iPhones to, to bulbs to USB cables, you know, everything in our lives, for the most part, at least 70% of it will have some component made in China. So it's, um, we have to figure out how to work with them. <laughs> um, someone said, you host two brands creators on your website. Are you working with others? Yes, we are actually, um, we're kind of interviewing for the next round of change makers. Um, I really want to be able to offer um, Beyond Knits is kind of the next big phase as well. Um, but I am also taking any nominations of anyone um, that people, we're doing a little bit offline. Most of, most of our outreach is through social, but if you want to reach out to me at sydney at publichabit.com, if you've got anyone in mind in the program, Let me tell um, I would absolutely love to talk. Okay, perfect. I'm just putting this in. Uh, let me see if there's any others. I think that might have been it for questions. I know a lot of people had written some comments about um, kind of just really replying to a lot of things you're saying. Uh, someone said, this is why I'm trying to find the right on-demand production manufacturing company to yeah. be sustainable with no inventory. Someone said, yes, anti-trend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, someone said, I started sewing my own clothes and outfits during the pandemic last in 2020. Good for you. Wow. I saw someone asked about the supply chain flat platform. I'll put, I think it's oh, commonobjective.co. Yeah. I think that's right um, um what else uh, someone said it happens a lot in the workforce i just made a recent shift from working with children and families holistic to focus on my writing career i have a love for fashion since my teens i lived in portugal and lisbon i love to learn with others who are in different fields thanks for having me here mm -hmm. um Someone said Liliana, that i just saw your question about uh what aspects of the development process oh, we yeah. offer um, we we are taking people who are mostly production ready. We have a technical designer that we do work with, but we try and work. We're trying to get this as hands off the wheel and ready for production as possible. Do you guys have a separate website for? Still behind the scenes right now. Okay, got it. All right, just check. It. Again, reach out to me directly if um, if anyone's interested in Powered by Public Habit. Okay, perfect. Um, and yeah, I think just going just from, you know, looking at a lot of these comments, I think a lot of people are either starting their own fashion line or in the fashion mm -hmm. industry. It's really interested in this topic. So um, really appreciate everyone for joining us today. And I hope you guys all found it really useful. Um, there's a ton of links in the chat there for you guys, if you want to just check those out um, before we wrap up. And if anyone wants to re-watch all of this um it will be up on the fashion and the free youtube channel on our website and we'll put a ton of things out on socials as well so if you do want to re-watch and, and think you feel like you want to listen to again um that will be available um so um as i said got at public habit for instagram at fashion and the free instagram i put the websites up there and um the article we did with sydney and yes yeah, so i just want to say thank you everyone for joining and thank you so much for sydney for giving up your time today to give everyone amazing advice um and to tell your story oh thanks so much for having me emma it's lovely to be here and definitely anyone reach out on all of the things i've been through quite a few of some of the challenges that I'm sure some of you are going through now. Yeah, for sure. I think, um, well, I, I think this chat's probably helped quite a lot of people that have tuned in, so that's great. So yeah, thank you every, so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. You as well. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Sydney. Bye.